Where is Marty? There we go. Hey, look who's on TV now. Hi, Mom. Um, we're back again. It's Math with Marty. Um, and uh, as you can see, it's, uh, it's uh, real warm here down in the studios. It's, we're taping this May the 14th, and uh, it was like 30 degrees today. And last time we taped, it was only two weeks ago, and we drove here on ice-packed roads. What a country we live in. But uh, it's nice to be here. And uh, what we've got to, to remind our viewers is the great news is that in the summertime, we're changing our time slot. We're going to be now on Tuesday nights at 10.30 in the evening, which means, the way they work things around here, that we will now be beaming to both sides of the Red River. So the miserable people east of the river who were so unlucky they couldn't watch us until now will get to see us every week on a regular time slot. Um, that's, uh, we have to say that. Why don't you say hello to some of those people over at uh, Northern Telecom? Uh, thanks, Neil. I understand we have some fans that have been uh, loyally watching us over at Northern Telecom, up in the engineering department, and we'd like to say greetings from the people at Mouth with Marty. <laughs> keep on watching. We're going to try and do more great math topics to keep, uh, keep you all happy. We had a real nice show last week. Um, and uh, we, uh, we did this uh, energy stuff. Yeah. We did a bunch of energy stuff, because I like I was saying, I'm trying to keep away from some of this heavy, super heavy math that I tend to sort of drift into if I'm left to my own devices. So what we started off by saying is that, and we talked you know, quite in detail about these figures, so we're pretty sure we had them more or less right, that Manitoba Hydro sells $400 million worth of electricity in a year. And, uh, and that comes to, uh, well, whatever it is, it's $400 million. And it's interesting to note that energy, you could buy it in the form of electricity, and it has a certain cost. You can buy it in the form of oil, and it has a certain cost. And when you tank up, you're paying, like, on the order of 40 cents a liter. And I've rounded to 40 so that I can do the long division easily. It means that, in terms of the equivalent liters of oil, that the output of Manitoba Hydro for one year, from its, you know, all the generating stations on those big rivers cranking away, is equivalent to one billion liters of oil. One billion liters of oil, which is one million tons of oil. Megaton of oil. The megaton of oil represents the energy available in that form of oil. And as we pointed out last week, energy in chemical form tends to uh, occupy the same pound-for-pound pound volume, whether you're burning oil, you're burning wood or alcohol. Pound-for-pound, pound, they're not all that different. So you could compare a megaton of oil, which is a million tons of oil, you could compare it to a megaton of TNT, which is the traditional measure they use to indicate the power of the big bombs that we're saving up uh, for uh, the happy day when we've got to push the big button. And uh, it's interesting to consider that if we really needed to harness nuclear fusion as a source of energy, and I think people know that we've succeeded in harnessing nuclear fission commercially as a source of energy, which means uranium, but people are all annoyed with nuclear fission. I, you know, I believe nuclear fission is a wonderful, uh, wonderful form of energy, but we have the small problem of waste disposal. They say, they say what are you going to do with all uh, the waste? What are you going to do with all the waste? And we're saying uh, in the Canadian program, they are saying um, that they were going to dig a hole a mile deep in geologically stable rock that hasn't had an earthquake in a billion years, and they were going to, they were going to melt the waste into glass and encase it in concrete and pour it down right at the bottom of the hole, so grout it all in with cement, and fill it back, fill up the hole, and then it would never come out. And... Uh, sounds good to me. It sounds like it would be hard for this stuff to get out. Um, however, there is one way which the nuclear waste could get out of the deep, deep hole. And one of the scientists at Pinwa explained it to me a long time ago. And it's like this. Geologically, by natural causes, I mean, you're burying it and casing it a mile down, it's not coming back. 
But what you're putting down there in the current scheme of things is they're talking about taking uh, uh, unprocessed nuclear fuel, the stuff out of the can-dos that's spent fuel, and putting it in directly without reprocessing. Reprocessing is very bad because reprocessing is tied up, it's associated with military usage. When you reprocess it, you develop materials which can be used in bombs. Now, therefore, as a political point, the government says that we do not consider reprocessing in, pro, we do not consider reprocessing as part of our waste management program. The waste must be disposed of as is. And what it means is because you're putting this stuff down in the ground that is very valuable, it is very valuable because you can make bombs with it. And the way it'll get back out of the ground is not that there will be an earthquake and the groundwater will seep up and carry it back up to the ground. The way it'll get back to the surface is a hundred years from now, or two hundred years from now, or a thousand years from now, or two thousand years from now, what have you, because it's still going to be valuable in two thousand years. A guy will take over Canada who makes uh, Saddam Hussein look like Martha Ray. And he will want to build the bombs. He will hire uh, slave labor to dig down into the holes and retrieve the plutonium that we've stored up for him. This is how the nuclear waste will get out of the ground. So if you're talking about long-term safety of nuclear waste, there is no safe nuclear waste handling program without reprocessing. And reprocessing doesn't have to be for military purposes. I mean, you can reprocess it, the idea of it, is that the stuff you get you use for nuclear energy generation. Now, you look at a country like France, who is committed to nuclear energy. They're an industrial country. They don't have the coal oil resources to do anything else. They are a serious nuclear country. Of course, they are into reprocessing in a big way. But it's not part of our North American uh, option. And it's, uh, it's a big problem for our nuclear industry in, in North America. We, we're not really building new plants because we don't quite know. Uh... Tell me, Marty, if um, Manitoba were run by nuclear energy, mm -hmm. how much spent fuel would it be, uh, you know, in, in, in pounds? Oh, I mean, the w would it be in a day or, or a month? The volumes are ridiculous. How small they are! The volumes compared to uh, conventional fuels are like a factor of ten thousand to one, and that is without reprocessing. If you reprocess them, then you get a hundred times more energy out of the source than you would have got if you didn't reprocess it. And then your uh, volume ratio is uh, more like uh, a million to one. I don't know if that's quite right what I just said, but I think it's sort of right. But anyway, let's be conservative and let's say 10,000 to one. Mm -hmm. In terms of conventional uh, carbon-based fuels, we can look at Manitoba's energy requirements as representing a billion liters of oil. Again, I mean, the economic uh, uh, common denominator, the $400 million, allows us to go back and forth between oil, electricity, and nuclear with, with total flexibility. It's a beautiful way of looking at things. Anyways, we say, what am I calling it? A billion liters of oil, a billion liters of oil, and one liter of oil is four inches by four inches by four inches, which is 10 centimeters. So a thousand liters of oil is a meter cubed. That's a thousand liters. And if I say a billion liters, then I've got to go by a hundred times more than that. So if we talk about our conventional fossil fuel requirements satisfying for Manitoba. This thing is a tank of oil, a hundred meters by a hundred meters by a hundred meters. That's what I'm trying to say. Now, if we, or to represent that in terms of the nuclear equivalent, we reduce our volumes by a factor of 10,000, which brings us down to, well, 1,000 would bring us to 10 by 10 by 10, and then we so go 10 back to 10. 10 by 10 by 1. 10 by 10 by 1. 10 meters by 10 meters by 1 meter. And like, we're talking a year? It's the room we're in this deep in, uh, in uh, uh, radioactivity. <laughs> okay, it's, it's a year. It's a year. It's, it's a small volume by so you know, this is why do people ever talk about shooting it out of the solar system? They do, but you worry about the rocket blowing up yeah, on the launching pad. Yeah, like the Challenger. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, but in terms of like industrial volumes, it is an extremely small amount. This is the beauty of nuclear energy. It's a fantastic invention. 
But, you know, when we're all finicky about how we're willing to use it or whether we're not willing to put up with the risk of waste, it's because we're in luxury. Our economy is running in beautiful condition. I mean, you talk about a recession. Man, every day my food is covered with my table. There's food on the table. I know there's people without jobs, but we're still getting welfare. Look, we're not all that bad. We could be in Iraq. We could be getting bombs dropped on us. We could be in a lot worse places. We're doing all right. We can afford to be luxurious about whether we choose to use the wasteful form of energy or not. But let's say we had really bad times in the country and there was a disaster and we really needed energy, that the lights were going out, that we were freezing in the cold and we really needed energy. Is energy available? And it's a funny way of looking at it. Nuclear fission, which we currently have, is a finite resource. I mean, it'll go for hundreds of years, but it's a finite resource. The nuclear fusion, if we could harness the energy of hydrogen, it is, of course, virtually unlimited because the oceans are full of hydrogen. But technologically, it is not being harnessed for electrical energy. Now, look, we don't have a nuclear reactor that will burn hydrogen at the present time. But if we really did need it for electrical energy, what I said last week is we could take one of the big bombs, which is a megaton, which is a billion liters of oil, which is $400 million worth of energy. We could uh, drop it down an abandoned mine shaft and blow it up, and it would be hot down there. The energy is converted to heat. We pour water down there and boil the water and extract the energy from the steam, run, run a steam turbine off it. It would be a year's worth of electricity. Maybe it's only 10% efficient because it's a very true thing. Yeah, you so, ten, so you'd use 10 bombs. You, you, exactly. <laughs> you use 10 of them. I, I mean, exactly. But anyways, like I say, it's a, it's a fascinating topic. And um, I wanted to backtrack a little, but let's do a song first. And then we'll get on to more of this great stuff. You want to give me a tempo, Marty? Um... Yeah, let's just not do this too slow. This is like one of the great traditions of American country music, which is the true American folk music, is the tradition of the story song. There is no uh, lyrics to speak of in normal pop music. If you look at the lyrics of rock music, they're more just sort of a kind of a, uh, a vehicle. Hey, baby, baby, hey, baby, let's get it on, baby. It's no kind of words. Then there's sort of, there's other songs with, with words like there's the jazz tradition. The lyrics there are very clever lyrics, and they're, in fact, maybe too clever by 50% to be really lyrics from the heart. In the same way, jazz is a very clever form of music, which is nice, but the lyrics, as far as lyrics, are a little too clever. It is really only in country music that you do get lyrics from the heart in expressive, the most expressive poetry in the English language since the days of William Shakespeare, and in fact to the contemporary ear much more pertinent than even the poetry of Shakespeare because, because as far as speaking to the contemporary listener. Now, let's do one of the great story songs from the country music tradition, which is the story of Fast. And 
Everybody thought they'd breathe their last, except John. Through the dust and the smoke of that man-made hell came a giant of a man the miners knew well. He grabbed hold of a timber and let out with a groan, and like a giant old tree just stood there alone. of a song. You know, uh, people uh, sometimes look at me and say, country music and mathematics, like isn't that sort of opposites? Um, like uh, from the intelligent to the stupid. You know, country music, people in our culture have a strange attitude to music. People who have never learned to play a musical instrument and don't know a C chord from a D chord, uh, somehow want to associate in musical terms with being more sophisticated and therefore they uh, prefer the more sophisticated so-called forms of music like jazz and opera or whatever have you which are wonderful forms of music which I as an actual musician have actually learned to play and studied and learned an instrument and I just studied the theory of it and with all my knowledge I fail to see that country music is inferior to other forms of music. So what the heck is it with people that they're so obvious to people that one form of music is superior to another? I uh, have never, uh, never really understand that. Never really understood that. But there it is. Was there murmurings in the audience going on about what I'm saying? I know we have several stalwart proponents of rock. You know, rock is a great thing. I mean, we are living in the age of rock and roll, although, I mean, maybe rap may be the final phase of the age in rock and roll. I mean, you know, even, it's not rock, but look what has happened to popular music. I mean, in, in the 70s, we had great bands. We had, uh, you know, the Eagles, we had the, the Bee Gees, we had the Doobie Brothers, we had, uh, you know, what have you. We had uh, the, the Steely Dan, I mean, Stevie Wonder. We, look, Carole King sold uh, millions of records. She had the best-selling record of all time with Tapestry. A fantastic creative artist with all kinds of records. And, and then in the 80s, we seem to hit an era of, of uh, commercialism, which has just uh, gone uh, the way of video. I mean, look at even the story of the black people in, in music. When I was a young man, the black people were known as the greatest musicians. We had, you know, Ray Charles and Stevie Wonder and Jose Feliciano. I mean, they, they were considered to excel in music. And now the young people uh, of the black people, they can only look at the rap artists as representing Guys their with, culture. whose mothers called them cool too. <laughs> <laughs> Is that their given name? Absolutely. <laughs> and they're still, I mean, the black people still have great music behind them. I only a few weeks ago uh, uh, said, uh, you know, the Caribbean show. And if, if you stay af tuned after our show when we're on the Monday night slot, you'll see the Caribbean guys. They got great music on their show. But uh, rap does seem to be uh, overwhelming, uh, overwhelming their, uh, their culture, which is uh, kind of a, an interesting development, uh, considering, considering the history behind it of jazz and what have you. Um, let us then uh, go back to our uh, 
a topic of uh, mathematics and do a little why. Why? <laughs> okay, okay, we're going back to the board. Okay, here we are. Here we are. <laughs> Um, okay, I do like to uh, tie together some, some more of these, uh, these energy things. And uh, I had uh, an economic calculation where I related uh, the value of electrical energy to the value of oil just through the, price of, uh, through the price. And it's a fairly good rough ballpark thing. But there's actual figures that, that uh, are associated with this. And I think I'd like to uh, write down the numbers. One liter of oil corresponds to an energy content of 39 megajoules. 39 megajoules. 39 megajoules. And we'll talk about what that means in a minute. But first, we will note that one kilowatt hour of electricity is. Uh, 1,000 watts times an hour is 3,600 seconds, 3,600 seconds, which is, well, a watt is a joule per second, so the joules per second cancels with seconds, which is 3.6 million joules. We'll call them megajoules, which was, I said, one kilowatt hour. So five cents of electricity, which you pay for at home, is 3.6 megajoules. But if you paid 50 cents, you would get 39 megajoules of oil. So as far as the retail price, they're fairly close. Now, there is something a little bit uh, deceptive in here, because, because if you were trying to uh, convert oil energy to electrical energy, there's an inefficiency of about 30% that kicks in because of, uh, because of uh, the thermal efficiency of a steam turbine system is intrinsically limited by the temperature differentials which the steam system operates at. So you cannot, in all situations, directly convert electrical to oil energy. Uh, if, the, if the end use of the energy is just to generate heat, then they are interconvertible. But if the end use is to turn a motor, or do mechanical work, then the electrical energy does represent a higher form of energy. There it is anyhow. Let's see if 39 megajoules makes sense. And it's interesting that it does make sense, because, because 39 megajoules, there's, as James Prescott Joule discovered in, by careful measurements in around 1860, one joule is, well, four joules is about one calorie. So 39 megajoules is about 10 megacalories, or in the units of calories which we talk about for eating food, it's like 10,000 calories. 10,000 calories. Because the calories you talk about in food energy is really 1,000 of the little calories, which is the metric unit of energy measurement. 10,000 calories, if you were to drink a liter of oil, the energy would be like 10,000 calories, which is uh, two pounds of oil is 10,000 calories. Now, you couldn't metabolize it in your body, but like I said, one form of carbon-based energy is pretty well as good as another. So for oil, you could substitute uh, lard or two pounds of butter, what have you. And uh, looks like we've uh, just about done. Time for the song. Well, I felt it all in word. Lord knows I tried. It's an awful awakening in a country boy's life. To look in the mirror in total surprise at the hair on.
got my first guitar.